I'm Philip Taubman, and I'm the uh, moderator of this uh, discussion we're going to have. Uh, I believe the programs that you have uh, give you the background on each of the individuals who are joining me here. Uh, Ward Halpern at the end, Roald Sagdeev, our playwright, Richard Rhodes, and Max Kappelman, uh, who was the United States Chief Arms Negotiator during the period under which the play is about. So let me start uh, by asking you, Richard, <clears throat> why did you write this play? Mm. You know, I was working on uh, my third volume of Nuclear History and got copies of the transcripts, both the Soviet and the American, of the Reykjavik summit meeting, and was just simply struck by how inherently dramatic this immensely important meeting between these two world leaders was. I was a friend of Paul Newman's, the actor, and I was at dinner with him one evening around this time and was telling him about these very dramatic transcripts and about how I thought it should be turned into a play. And Paul said, I'll help you with that. So he did. He was ill with leukemia that last year of his life. I would send him a draft and he would, I would call him up to see what he thought and he would say, Rhodes, colloquialize, colloquialize. And the whole work of this play has been really turning diplomatic documents into speech between these two men. The play draws not only on the transcripts, but also on Gorbachev's books and uh, Reagan's books. So much of what you heard was authentic from the point of view of the people. But that's how the play came about, and it was because, God, what a moment in history this was. So let, let me ask uh, Loal, uh, who was a science advisor uh, to Gorbachev. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the play uh, about the word laboratory, uh, and that's really, of course, where the negotiations got hung up. Uh, so when you look back at that, and when you talked to Gorbachev before he went to Reykjavik, and when you talked to him when he came back, uh, could there have been some kind of understanding about the definition of the word laboratory that President Reagan could have accepted, do you think? I think there was a chance, and uh, in my view, that chance was lost. Uh, Gorbachev's foreign minister, Edward uh, uh, Shevardnadze, immediately uh, invited me and said, what would be your definition of the laboratory? Is it someone uh, in a hidden uh, basement tinkering with little gadgets? I said, no, read Pravda newspaper after every launch of cosmonauts in orbit. Uh, Pravda on the front page would say, we are building orbital laboratory. So space is laboratory. So what is the limit? Limit is the size of what we are doing. What kind of harm we can deliver to somebody else's uh, spacecraft or instrument. And he said, can you go to New York, to United Nations, and to, to explain it? I said, when? He said, tomorrow. <laughs> so actually, it took a little bit more, maybe two, three days. So and then I came uh, to United Nations and spoke at political committee, explaining what is my view of laboratory. Next day, New York Times and Washington Post said, Soviet official admitted that space is also laboratory. So you know what happened? When I came back, I had a lot of trouble with it. <laughs> now, Max Kappelman was uh, in Reykjavik. He was there behind the scenes uh, when the discussions were going on and when the aides were meeting later. Max, can you give us some sense of the drama that was going on behind the scenes? It wasn't very long before it became clear to me that uh, President Reagan was determined to try to do something to avoid a conflict and to avoid a war. President Reagan uh, met with Gorbachev 
and uh, their discussion led both of them to feel that they ought to get together mm. and uh, exchange views, do what they could about civilizing the potential conflict. I asked George Shultz not long ago uh, for a book I wrote about uh, nuclear weapons. And he, by the way, in the room with uh, Gorbachev and Reagan were both uh, George Shultz, the American Secretary of State, uh, and Eduard Shevardnadze, the Soviet Foreign Minister. Uh, and I asked Shultz just about a year ago, uh, if he looked back on Reykjavik, was there anything that he regretted? He paused for a minute. Uh, and then he said, I wish we had explored the definition of the word laboratory. But I know we want to spend some time here tonight uh, talking about where we have gotten since Reykjavik uh, and where we're going from here. So Mort, uh, if I may, uh, as a longtime uh, observer and participant in foreign policy discussions, when you look back on Reykjavik and project forward to where we are today, how much progress do you think we've made? Well, it depends on what your expectations are. I think the most important progress that we've made is that nuclear weapons have not been used. And I think our goal going forward needs to be to continue that moratorium on the use of nuclear weapons. I think what Reykjavik symbolized in a way was the acceptance by both countries that they did not need nuclear weapons to meet their security needs, that their common security, as Gorbachev put it, could be met without nuclear weapons. So whether we know actually how to rid the world of nuclear weapons, in my view, the more important thing is to rid both of those countries and eventually all countries of the notion that somehow nuclear devices all weapons that can be used uh, in military combat. They cannot, they are not, cannot be the basis of security. And I think in a way Reykjavik signaled uh, the agreement on that. There's a, an interesting question here uh, that uh, goes to one of the motivations uh, that prompted Gorbachev uh, perhaps to make the proposals he did and may have some bearing on arms control issues today. And that is whether the strain, the economic strain, this is for you, Raul, Raul, the economic strain of the arms race, and there's still a lot of money spent on defense in both our nation and in Russia, uh, impinge on the ability of the societies to develop in other ways. And was it a motivation for Gorbachev uh, when he went to Reykjavik? And is the high defense spending today a motivation, do you think, for Russia to try to reduce its nuclear stockpile? Definitely for Gorbachev, uh, reduction of military budget was an issue of highest priority. Uh, military industrial complex, uh, 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 eventually uh, Soviets admitted we also had it, uh, was consuming a lot of uh, resources, efforts. And uh, Gorbachev started to implement reduction, something like 7 8% annually. Uh, of course, uh, today's uh, Russia economy is different. Military budget is much smaller than it was before. And uh, it's slightly growing. But uh, unfortunately, it's growing in the rest of the world. Uh, Hans Blix, you remember his name, he was a, a uh, uh, general Director of International Atomic Energy Agency during uh, critical years uh, uh, before the Iraqi war. He gave a talk uh, recently. He said even Greece <coughs> on the verge of economic collapse was increasing as a mad uh, military budget. So I think it's now a, a generic problem for many countries. I really I waver back and forth between some guarded optimism and some deep pessimism. I say that because, to some degree, nuclear weapons have become the coinage of, uh, of national power in the world, in the minds of some nuclear powers. The uh, defense minister of India in 1998, when India tested a number of weapons, 
announce now the big boys are going to have to let us sit at the table with them. That's a different use than one for national security. That's for national prestige or international power. And to the extent that the weapons represent that to potential nuclear powers as well as existing, uh, it worries me a great deal. Uh, and the fact is the great offenders continue to be, most of all, the United States. Even though we've made efforts to reduce our arsenal in concert with, with Russia, uh, for us, obviously, this is still a very important part of what we consider to be our national power and the projection of that power. Thus, uh, we read within the last week of a proposal coming out of the National Nuclear Security Administration to invest some $600 billion in so-called modernizing our nuclear arsenal, uh, all in the name somehow of making it secure without the need for nuclear testing. So that's the downside to me, that there really is not yet the political will, even within this country, which speaks often of this problem, to move forward on the elimination of nuclear weapons. The other side is in particular with the comprehensive test ban organization, the continued development of an international worldwide system for monitoring and tracking any possible developments along these lines, and the continued movement of countries that are not nuclear powers to endorse the principles of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. There is a growing, I think, moral pressure, which ultimately must have its effect just as the moral pressure against slavery eventually had its effect. I don't think it will happen quickly, but I think we see a slow, gradual decline when before we saw an almost exponential increase. So I go back and forth between those two poles, I'm afraid, as perhaps we all do. Mort, do you think we should eliminate nuclear weapons? I don't think we know how to eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, Governments will always know how to make them, and the only question is how far away are they from an operational capability. Yeah. I do think we can f drastically reduce the size of the arsenals. I think we can further reduce the value of nuclear weapons. I do not think it's true that any state gains political prestige and credibility from their nuclear weapons. I don't think the Indians have, whatever they thought was going to happen. I don't think the Pakistanis have. I don't think the Chinese did. Chinese power in the world came from when they became an economic power. They had nuclear weapons long before that. I bet none of you know when China first exploded its nuclear weapon. Nobody really cared. Nobody paid attention. It did not give them prestige. I fear that we're stuck on the same issue that we heard explicated in the play. The United States is not willing to reaffirm a commitment not to deploy ballistic missile defenses. And Russia will not agree to any further reductions in its strategic arsenal unless we agree to that. So we're on exactly the same uh, conflict as we had then. I thought that the Star Wars made no sense. It was technologically infeasible. And it was, as Gorbachev says in the play, unnecessary if you're going to eliminate nuclear weapons. I think nuclear, uh, ballistic missile defenses now cannot work against Russia or against China, and that we ought to be willing to put limits on it to make it clear that their only value is against small powers. Unless we do that, I fear there will be no further progress in reducing the size of the nuclear arsenal. In Reykjavik, when we had both countries there, both leaders there, about the second or third day, all of us thought we had an agreement. Hmm. And that was way back then. <laughs> and uh, both sides wanted an agreement. It ended up without an agreement. But the fact of the matter is, you had planted there with both countries the desirability and the need to get rid of nuclear weapons. And I felt that's important to communicate here. The, the issue that we're talking about is, is, it has an interesting current resonance, which is uh, Richard Pearl, 
uh, who was at Reykjavik, was the uh, senior uh, nuclear weapons expert at the Pentagon during the Reagan administration, attended a conference recently uh, that I participated in at Stanford University. And to my amazement, uh, Richard Pearl said, we have to get off the notion that all future uh, reductions in arms, nuclear weapons, must be done through treaty negotiations. Mm. Uh, that it's time t for the United States and Russia independently to reduce their own nuclear arsenal arsenals down to a level that they think is commensurate with their security. Uh, and so I want to ask Roald about this, uh, because if you were advising President Putin today, would you recommend to him that Russia can cut its arms independent of whatever cuts the United States might make? And, and how would you make that case if you think it's a case worth making? I think there are many arguments in favor of such approach. Uh, one simple argument is that uh, there were two superpowers. Russia is not anymore superpower. So why to pretend keeping that huge uh, nuclear arsenal? Mm. So, you know, it's possible for those of us uh, who follow these events, think back to the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, he actually made uh, a lot of unilateral cuts in American nuclear weapons, particularly the battlefield weapons that were discussed in the play. He just decided we didn't need them anymore. He decided to cut them. He made the announcement, and then the uh, uh, Russians followed suit and made uh, similar cuts on their own. So it's, a, it's an interesting approach to go towards the future. Richard? I think the problem with that possibility, and one of the central problems with reducing nuclear arms in the United States, is the political divide between Republican and Democrat. In a sense, I think nuclear weapons, to some degree, have become hostage to domestic politics. It seemed clear to me, for example, that the whole idea of SDI and missile defense became, for people like Richard Pearl, glad to hear he's had a change of heart, Saul on the road to Damascus, as it were. Uh, for them, it was an alternative to having to negotiate. And actually, he's not inconsistent in his argument that we should reduce, but let's not negotiate. So it, if you could say, well, we have a defense, then you don't have to sit down at the table and negotiate with those Russians whom you can't trust. That kind of thing still haunts, it seems to me, the whole issue of what this country will do and can do. Mm -hmm. For example, President Obama in his second term, what's he going to do? Is he going, I've heard rumors that he's not even going to get close to further dealings with the nuclear issue, despite the fact that he will not have to worry about being reelected. I actually am optimistic that Good. he will uh, announce major unilateral reductions Good. and maybe tie them to some evidence that the, that the Russians are moving uh, in the same direction. I also think he will move towards reducing our reliance on a hair-triggered nuclear posture. I mean, the most insane thing is, is that we and the Russians still have a nuclear posture uh, which is geared to be used within the first half hour of a nuclear conflict. We still have a launch on morning capability. We still train and plan as if the President of the United States might fire missiles at Russia because he is told the Russians have fired missiles at the United States. That is for both countries absurd, and I believe it is possible that we will move off that uh, in the next four years by unilateral steps uh, on, on the two sides. That would be wonderful. Let, let me say a word or two about Obama's policies. I've, I've tried to follow them fairly closely. Uh, when he came into office, he gave a speech in Prague, you may remember, uh, just a couple of months after he became president. And it was, a, a, at least by my life, a very enlightened uh, speech in which he called for ultimately the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, but he put his administration on the road to reductions and all kinds of steps that would bring American forces into a, a more rational uh, relationship to the threats we face today. Since then, he has not had much to say about nuclear weapons. This year, 
don't expect him to say anything in the next four weeks unless he comes <laughs> up with a debate. Because I'm sure that he and his advisors have decided that anything he says about reducing nuclear weapons right now uh, will become a subject for uh, Mitt Romney uh, to accuse the Obama administration of being soft on defense. However, if Obama is reelected, I agree with Mort, there may be some very interesting things happening. <coughs> Some of you may not know, or most of you may not know, that even as we sit here, uh, there is a big review going on in the Obama administration about the nuts and bolts of American nuclear policy. Uh, and if you want to cut nuclear weapons, if you want to get the United States off the Cold War mindset that it's still in today, where nuclear deterrence and 1,550 weapons is necessary uh, to American defense, you have to start by cutting the number of targets that we are planning to hit with our nuclear weapons. That target set is set by the Pentagon under the direction of the President. They are currently reviewing the target set. The only way we're going to get the number of American weapons down is if we reduce the number of targets. We still, in 2012, expect to attack hundreds literally, hundreds of targets in Russia, hundreds of targets in China, targets in other countries. I don't think that's a realistic way to approach our defense, but you know, I only have one vote. President Obama could make some really important changes in this area. So I want to ask Roal, do you think that President Putin would change the Russian target set so that there would not be the necessity of keeping enough weapons to hit hundreds of targets in the United States? Well, I think it, uh, he probably would wait until the end of elections, because right now he's worried uh, after Mitt Romney called Russia any number one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Here, here's a question that, uh, let's start with you, Mort. You worked in the White House on the National Security Council. Uh, during the Nixon administration uh, and have been involved in these issues for a long time. Are nuclear weapons immoral? Uh, do they violate international uh, humanitarian laws? Could they be used against a state with nuclear weapons, against terrorists, against a state without nuclear weapons? I think uh, the place to start is with the fact that these are not weapons. Uh, they have no military utility. They cannot be used against military targets. They cannot be used to influence the outcome of a, of a war. Again, I think it was Gorbachev who's quoted in saying that if you drop them on us, it doesn't matter whether we retaliate because we'll all be gone anyway. Uh, so I think the place to start is they are not weapons. They have no use as an instrument of policy. And I think any use of them uh, would be immoral, would be counterproductive, and would be dangerous. And if you try to think about using them in response to anybody else's actions, even the use of a nuclear weapon by, say, the North Koreans or the Iranians, it turns out to be uh, a disastrous policy, immoral, and ineffective. So I think we need to understand where the, I think the United States is going, and the President has come close to saying the sole purpose of the nuclear weapons is to prevent others from being tempted to use them. Uh, and any other consideration of a use is immoral, illegal, ineffective, and extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, by the way, among the people who share that view is General Colin Powell, uh, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, if you go and look at what he said about nuclear weapons, he says they are simply not weapons that could ever be used. Uh, and a very senior American military officer, I can't tell you who, because of the ground rules at this discussion I attended, again, at, at Stanford, uh, but one of the most senior American military commanders was asked at this meeting, uh, under what circumstances would you imagine the United States using its nuclear weapons? And his answer essentially was almost none, uh, and certainly none under which we would use more than a handful of weapons. Uh, so the idea that we still have thousands of them really doesn't make any sense strategically, 
morally and other ways. Uh, let's spend a minute or two uh, talking about the treaty uh, that would uh, ban the testing of nuclear weapons, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. This is a treaty that uh, President Clinton uh, signed, uh, but that the United States Senate rejected uh, in a, a vote, I believe it was 1999. Uh, so my question, uh, let me start with you, Richard, as a student of all of this. Uh, is it conceivable in the current state of politics in Washington that the Senate would ratify that treaty? Don't forget it requires a two-third vote for ratification. My understanding is that the primary barrier uh, was the Republican leadership under Senator John Kyle, and that a deal was cut with President Obama that $85 billion would be spent modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal. How that connects to this more recent report of at least a proposal for $600 billion worth of so-called modernizations, I'm not sure. But it seems clear that the president is working toward mollifying in some way the, uh, the, the Republican leadership that has resisted allowing the CTBT to be uh, ratified. And that I would guess that Obama probably would like to see that happen in his second term. Whether it will, will really depend on this toxic relationship in Washington between Republicans and Democrats. But there are reasons why the Republican Party might well want to be a part of such an historic agreement as well. And I don't think that any of the plans for modernization have imagined such a thing as a nuclear test. In fact, one of the arguments for them for modernizing has been that we must do this because we can't test our weapons anymore, paradoxically. More, do you have a sense of the prospects for this? Yeah, well, this is a very old fight. I wrote my first article in favor of the nuclear test ban in 1960 and did a memo for Kennedy uh, in 1962 arguing for the test ban. So I've been persuaded by the arguments for a long time. I don't think there's any question that the administration is committed uh, to the test ban, and I think there will be a major effort in the next administration. What it's going to take is a senior Republican senator, John McCain or McConnell. We remember we got the first test ban because Eric Everett Dirksen, who was then the Republican leader, had a conversion. So I think all of you should go out and talk to the Republican senators that you're closest to and tell them <laughs> we need a Republican senator to stand up and say, Eric Dirksen did this for his grandchildren. I'm doing it for mine. Uh, there is no rational reason not to do the test ban treaty. George Bush did not come close to testing in his eight years as president. No president of the United States will test. In fact, no president of the United States will have the legal authority to test because there is a solid majority in both the House and the Senate against testing, and it is illegal. The president is not authorized to test. He's never going to get permission to test. We will never test. And in, therefore, it is clear, in my view, it is unmistakably in our interest to get this treaty ratified and to stop putting pressure on countries like India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Iran that might test to make it illegal and to f get them to sign into the treaty.